Welcome back to the Race Recap, streaming not live to the upper Midwest and 27% of the time in Slovakia. Your number one source for low budget, high quality ski racing content. Today we are going to be talking about the Killington Slalom, uh, another great race. Uh, there were a lot of girls that are skiing really well uh, right now and in this race. Stick around to the end and I will have a hot take on the Michaela and Petra rivalry as we stand right now, as well as a deep dive into Hannah Orison Elfman's career. That's some pretty cool stuff. Let's check that out later. But first, I want to read a comment that I got on one of my previous YouTube videos. This is from Luca Zaccagnini. Luca Zaccagnini. So obviously, this guy is European, and so we should take what he says more seriously than American stuff. And this is his comment. And this is on the video, what is early edge pressure, a ski racing analysis. And that's where I do a deep dive on the board here into what early edge pressure is. So if you want to check that out, go look at it. Luca says, so fascinated by this video, exclamation point, a true in-depth analysis of racing skiing that combines general expert skiing technique with racing constraints. I couldn't have said it any better myself. I never would have used it in that uh, structure. However, thank you, Luca. I have been looking at ski racing for such a long time, and I've always been trying to find better ways of analyzing what I'm seeing. And at this point, what I'm trying to show as much as possible is where turn pressures is, what turns look like, uh, I don't think there's a one turn fits all solution to this and there's a lot of different turns being made on the World Cup right now, which I'm excited to get into later. Um, but thank you, Luca, for recognizing that. I really appreciate it. Which brings me to begging for subscribers. Um, this YouTube channel is something that I'm putting together and I'm trying to take seriously and at some point I would like to be making money from YouTube. I am putting this out there and as far as I'm concerned for free and all you have to do is hit that little subscribe button and watch my videos and someday I'll start making money off of this. So that's the goal for me. You can help me with that by subscribing. To up the production value in the show, the, here are some pictures from Killington. My dad drove over there and took pictures of the race venue the days before. Um, he told me on the way in it looked really good early making snow for them and then late they ran out of temperatures and didn't get a lot. And I'll tell you, this is the least amount of snow I've ever seen on the side of uh, Superstar to get this World Cup off. But really cool that they got this World Cup off. Um, great job by Killington. Tough weather the first day, but the second day the slalom was top notch. Still tough weather. Um, I love it. I can't wait to go to the Killington World Cup in person sometime. I would also like to announce that ski season is underway here in Park City and today for the first time I get to take Bryce and Dylan up to the canyons uh, and ski high meadow with them. Fantastic day up there. Day one, skiing with my boys, totally awesome. I need subscribers so I can buy more rad gear like this. Before we get into today's race, let's take a minute to thank our sponsors, Course Reports. As the first generic Course Report product brought to market, Course Reports are probably the most important thing you can buy for your up and coming racer. The compact cassette tape packaging makes the perfect stocking stuffer. Sugarloaf GS, Snowbird Slalom, and Park City CBGS are currently available. Order today and get 50% off Spirit Mountain, Minnesota. A Course Report? Are you kidding me? You can see the entire course from the start. Let's get after it. To order, email joethedad33 at gmail.com. Shipping rates apply. I tell you what, Brett, those course reports are the best value on the market right now. Let's get into today's race. Uh, we'll go through the entire second run, starting with the 30th qualifier from the first run, Shiari Meyer. Uh, she was fast on the top. She is certainly struggling at the start of this season. However, I did see some little pop, a little pep in her skiing on the top, and I think that there are some good results coming for her. Maybe not quite yet. Maybe not on the Killington snow surface, which was tricky because it was really, really firm, and the announcer said that it was icier on the course than it was in the warm-up courses, so it was tougher for girls to get the true feel for the snow, especially on that uh, bottom pitch. Next out of the gate uh, was Mina First-Holtman. Um, 
Didn't look like she had any grip on the pitch. Uh, she was one of the ones that made it look obvious right away that it was slicker on course than it was up top. Uh, Shiari Meyer, she was 25th overall. Mina First Holtman, 28th. Uh, next up was bib number 60, Hannah Orison Elfman. Um, and if you don't know who she is, pay attention to her name right now. This girl is going to be it on the circuit soon. She came out and just ripped it. She skied that second run like she was just in a, a training run in the middle of the summer on a beautiful day when everything was feeling good and feeling right. And she just went and ripped it. And everyone's like, oh, she's got uh, potential. That's what she looked like on that second run. She went out. There was no fear. There was no hesitation. Uh, she looked really, really good. And she's going to be part of our breakdown later. Stick around for that. Hannah comes down 1.53 ahead. Big lead. And then I was like, all right, let's see how long she can hold on to this. Next up was Lena Popovich. Uh, good skiing again from Lena. I like the way she skis. Uh, didn't quite have it on the pitch. Ends up 21st. Decent result for her. Next, Frederica Brigioni, the GS skier, um, skiing slalom. This was probably the best slalom run I've ever seen Frederica take. I thought she looked good. It was calm. It was in control. A lot of times she's wild and crazy. This time she really mellowed it out and was clean and was smooth and was just enough across the line and, and did a really good job for herself. Uh, 22nd place, you know, if she can get her start position up into the teens, she can start going a little harder on first run, build a little confidence. There's no reason to think Frederica Brigioni can't start going top 15 in slalom soon. After Frederica was met a robot, um, we missed most of her run because there was a commercial for Paula Molson playing. But what I did see from Meta was virtually no edge set. She was coming in feathering the ski, feather, 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 and was still feathering when she released. I'm like, oh, there was really no place where she set the edges and carved the skis, even at the bottom of the turn, even at the very bottom of the turn. Um, and so it was kind of just muted, just slidey, 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 slidey. Um, it looked like she was just trying to get down the course cleanly. I think she did that. She ends up 24th on the day. She's another one that needs to stack up some results to get her starting position moved up um, into the teens at least, and then she can start ripping again. Um, again, back to the commercial about Paula Moulton. I know a guy who makes commercials. Let's take a minute to take a look at Outside Ski Pressure. Do you want outside ski pressure like this? Because I can give it to you. I just put it in this rock and mail it to you. Don't worry, I'm legit. The reason these rocks work is because someone cared deeply about them. I use the ancient Blackhawk tradition of self-actualizing the outside ski pressure into the rock. Is it in? Yeah, I think it is. Just pull it out of the package and it's yours. Outside ski pressure rocks are $600. Each are made special order. Please contact joe the dad 33 at gmail.com for ordering instructions. Uh, coming back to action after the Paula Moulton commercial, we miss Charlie Guest, which is a bummer because she's a hot skier right now. She was 23rd overall in the day. We did get to see Marie Therese Sporier, however, bib 37. She smoked one. She came... Um, she came down one one hundredth off of Hannah's time, um, and she lost four tenths at the bottom split. So uh, Marie Therese Borja was ripping one all the way until the last split, and she just didn't quite have the speed across the line. But that was a great run from her. She ends up sixteenth on the day. Great skiing. Then came Aaron Milzinski, and. Ted Ligeti and I are absolutely on the same page when it comes to Erin Milzinski. She has a beautiful style. It's one of the best on the World Cup. What I've seen out of Erin Milzinski over the last two years is she's frustrated after every single run in the finish line. And I know why, because there's sloppy runs coming down. But it seems like she's skiing with a major monkey on her back. And maybe that monkey on her back is that every time she's on course, there's someone talking about that one ski race that she won 12 years ago in a slalom. And then we say it like, oh, that's the only win in her career. I, I don't think that win says anything about her since for the last two years, she's in the, in the 20s battling her way, trying to make it happen in a World Cup. 
I think she's good enough to be at the top tier in the World Cup, but there's some kind of pressure, some kind of release that she needs to feel confident to just flow some runs together. And maybe she needs to stop trying to be so fast in sections. And But somehow she's got to control it because she's got the beautiful skiing. She's got the touch for the snow. She's got the angles. It looks really, really good. But there's just something missing with Aaron. And I hate seeing her frustrated in the finish line every time. So... Best of luck to Aaron moving forward. Um, Ted Lady thinks you're one of the best skiers out there. I think you're one of the best skiers out there. You're going to get it. Next up, Taya Louise Sersand. Uh, she comes down, and she is out by 1.86. I said it after Levy. The Norwegians don't have the depth and slalom. They're making second runs. They're in there, but they just, they're just they missing some top-end speed. However, that's not totally true because Tveiberg is back. Um, and she's ripping. So they have the pace and training. Um, I think they just need to, these these later girls, Shersend and Holtman, need to find the touch with the snow on the pitches better. <clears throat> I don't know if that needs to happen in inspection or what the deal is. Next up is Elena Stoffel of Switzerland. She was BIP 35, ends up 25th on the day. She made a big mistake across the top flat, uh, the same as Thea Louise Shearson as well. If you're making mistakes up there, then you're probably charging too hard. Um, I don't know. It's, it's not a great place to make a mistake. But through this day, a lot of girls made a mistake in that section on the top, um, somewhere after the first intermediate. It would throw them. It's where Michaela made the mistake. It's where Petra made the mistake. It's where almost all the girls made the mistake. Might have even been the same gate, but it was hard to tell with the camera angle. Um, after her, uh, Katrina Huber um, was in touch to come down with the winning time. However, she went out like five gates from the bottom DNF. She had some speed. It was some good-looking skiing happening. Unfortunate for her. After her was Camille Rast. Um, Love watching Camille Rasky. She was dicing on the main pitch. She had a section at the top of the main pitch that was out of sight fast and then made a mistake coming into the flush that was in the middle of the pitch. And she came down uh, 1 100th off the lead, uh, second place, but was dicing on that pitch. Next up was Anna Sven Larson. She comes down 0.83 up on Hannah. She ripped. She was super aggressive um, when she was in the finish line. She was yelling at Hannah in the finish line for being like that teenager that just did it. Sven Larson looked great. She was a little off on her first run, did not have the mojo first run, was pretty ragged and all over the place down the pitch and really kind of blew her day first run. Uh, but then second run, she comes down. She came out aggressive, skied the way she should to be in the top seven, which is where she belongs. Um, and she moves all the way into ninth with that ripping skiing. I loved the way she was yelling at the teenager in the finish line. That team is looking awesome. Can't wait to see what's going to happen with them. At this point, Hannah Arson Elfman was had moved up 10 spots. And let's take a minute to... to take Hannah's career trajectory uh, into account here. So Hannah raced and sold in this season where she was 26 in the GS. So it's not crazy that she's making second runs. She went to sold and made the second run, got 26, great job in sold. And she came to Killington not planning on racing the slum. She was just here for the GS. However, they just threw her into the slum. Now let's move backwards into last year, where at the end of the season, she was third in the slalom, the GS, and the Super G at the Swedish Nationals. So that's a huge confidence builder. She also won the GS at Junior Worlds last season and was fourth in the Super G at Junior Worlds. So this is a high-quality prospect coming up. Um, before that last year, she had a ton of top fives in Europa Cup. So this is a girl that on the Europa Cup circuit kind of came in about a year and a half ago, got a lot of 20-ish 20 20 places, and then got a top 10, a few more 20s, top 10, 20, top 10, top 10, 20, top 10, top 5, top 7, top 6, top 20. Top, and, you know, just pegged her way through the Europa Cup circuit. A lot of good results, a lot of single-digit results. She's been building all last season, so no surprise that a girl like this is coming up. She's 
on pace. She's 18 years old. That's about how old Michaela was when she came on the circuit. And I think this is a huge confidence boost for her. And with the way she's ripping through the Europa Cup circuit, there's no reason to think that she can't just do that through the World Cup circuit. I think the coolest thing that I found with her, though, she was top 10 in her first seven fist races when she was a young athlete coming into fist for the for, fist for the first time. Let's read through them. I'm going to start with the first fist race she ever did. 46 points, 40 points, 32 points, 30 points, 36 points, 54 points, 23 points. Those are all top 10s. Then the next day, that would be race eight. The second, fourth day of a four-day series, she goes 17th in a slalom, scores a 75. Then the day after that, she comes out ninth, not the day after that. The next series she goes to, she comes out ninth, first run, scores a 38. So this girl has been a total baller the whole time. Hopefully we're on to something. And Hannah Arsand Elfman is the real deal. Next up was uh, Martina Dubovska. Um, I like Martina Dubovska. She, she's good. Uh, however, we didn't get to see much of her run because the Paula Molson breakdown was happening. And it was called the, the Fidelity Green Line Recap. What a great idea. I mean, it's about time that we've got a coach talking through movements of an athlete on the big screen so that the rest of America can see what's happening and what coaches are looking for out of their athletes at that level, and then it can filter down through and get into all the lower ranks of American ski racing, and we can start talking on the same page with all of these athletes. Next, we just need them to break down a bunch of turn shapes of some of the best girls on the World Cup. Let's talk about the Fidelity Green Line recap. The first section, the coach talks about the rebound, the control coming out of the turn. Um, I prefer to think of that jump as a move into the new turn. Um, he says the apex placement is in the sweet spot. And in the gate, he shows it. I am in total agreement on what the sweet spot is, which is above the gate, outside of the rise line. Um, Above the gate, outside of the rise line. That is where the apex should be hit every turn with pitch in slalom and GS. The gate that he froze, however, was an entry into a hairpin. So I'm not sure if that's the best gate as the example of her doing it right because she's coming to a hairpin. I would have liked to have seen where she was starting her turn or apexing her turn on the open gates above it. On the flat, the coach talks about the big bend in the ski, lots of upper body discipline to make those good, powerful turns. The other thing that's happening here is Paula is using a lot of the leg extension, pushing power into the ski, so her force is going down into the snow through her legs, pushing forward, bending the ski, so then the ski, when it rebounds forward, like Ted Liggett was talking about in the broadcast, gives her more momentum going across the hill. But pushing into the snow is how I like to talk about it in base skiing, and I call that move where she's pumping on the flats big extension going into the turn. Was that my base skiing breakdown? We'll do this would be the base skiing breakdown. Never mind. Back to live action. Katrina Troupe, the tiniest pressure on the World Cup. That's why we're going to talk about her up here. She was looking pretty good. She was just behind the course a little bit. Her edge pressures were still quick and nice, but they weren't quite as above the gate as they needed to be for her to be very fast. In any case, she ends up 14th. That's a top 15 result. I don't care who you are in the World Cup. That's a quality result. So good for Katrina Truppe, 14th today. At this point, they show Vilhova burying her boots. It's 27 degrees out at Killington, and she's burying her boots. That means she wants her boots locked up tight. Vilhova is a big girl, and she wants those things stiff. Did the stiff boots, maybe they were overly stiff, and that's why she got her inside ski stuck on the course. Might have just been onto something there. Vilhova, don't bury your boots next time. It's 27 degrees. You didn't need it. After Trupe on a Butchich, she ends up 12th on the day. Good, accurate skiing. She's not the most athletic, but the way she's doing it now with the Austrian slalom technique, turning her hips towards the next gate in the slalom course, it's good skiing. The ski is clean under her right now, and she's got tempo. So Anna Bucic, she comes down eh, maybe third or fourth, I don't know, but 0.25 off the pace. Up next was Marie-Therese Tweiberg. She came down to first place, 0.24 up. Um... I was just so psyched to see her out there to start the race first run because I was really concerned she had hurt her knee in Levy. However, she came back and she looked strong, 
doesn't appear to have lo uh, lost anything. Really psyched to see Tweiberg still out there doing it, skiing strong, because she is having a great start of the season. She goes from 12th in the first run, moves up into 8th. Top 10 result in slalom. Good for her after a big crash second, run, uh, second day at Levy. After her was uh, Lorraine St. Germain of Canada. She fell in the finish line, lost both her poles. It was kind of funny. I don't know. She just charged in, got a little over forward. One ski went wonky. She pole planted and almost stabbed her in the side. No, no, it was spectacular. Uh, but Ted Ligeti made a great comment about her in that she is all knees and ankles. And I couldn't agree more. And any of the girls that are out there that have good control of their knees and ankles are the ones that are competing and doing really good. And I think Ted pointing it out in St. Germain is a great place for people to go and look and watch St. Germain and say, oh, that's what knees and ankles is. Watch St. Germain's second run from Killington and see what knees and ankles or skiing slalom with knees and ankles looks like. Next up, Michelle Gissine. She comes down 0.44 behind, 11th place for her. A great top section again for her, but just holding on to her edges below the gate a little too much all the way down the pitch. After her, Andrea Schlokar, who has been skiing awesome this year. She goes 10th overall. Andrea Schlokar is running the longest radius or trying to do the longest edge pressure longest ski pressure on the World Cup on the ladies circuit right now. She will be a big part of a breakdown later. She does a lot of hip angle. Yes, we know. Is that on there? Hip angle. After Schlokar was Sarah Hector, who ripped one. She comes down to first place, 0 .30 up. A great run, top to bottom. Sweden has a ton of momentum right now with three girls who are absolutely fast Skiing slalom, in races, and getting it done. So really cool for Sweden. Um, I like them all. Uh, Kristen Lisdahl was up next. She made a big mistake on the flats and then fell in the flush on the middle of the pitch at the bottom of Killington. It was tough to tell that it was a flush in the middle of the pitch at the bottom because they went into the flush on one camera angle and then came out of the flush on another camera angle. So it kind of looked hairpin to a hairpin. Kind of situation and it took me for a while watching the race to figure out that that was a flush right there and why so many girls were getting such wildly different times as they made it through the final split because some of them were slowing down a lot going into the flush and then some of them were taking speed through the flush and then making mis big mistakes below it and because i didn't have my head wrapped around that it was a flush for like most of the race um, it was hard to tell where they were losing that time because it was difficult to, to call that split going into the finish. Some girls were three tenths faster with the same skiing as someone who was three tenths slower. So interesting little uh, eccentricity from today's race. Uh, after Lisdahl was Paula Moulton. Oh, did I say uh, Lisdahl fell in the flush? That was the whole point. Paula Moulton was next. She was six on the first run. She came down just two, uh, 28 hundredths out um she was just clean top to bottom she was good top to bottom but it was just clean there wasn't anything special about it she did however coming out of the flush at the bottom she didn't do the release that some of the girls did to make up a lot of that time so she's one of those girls that was like three tenths slower on that bottom split with what looked like the same skiing because she didn't just come out of the flush and release and just ski in the fall line carve every turn until the finish line but Sick to see Paula Moulton throwing out a legit top 10 finish, seventh place on the day in front of the home crowd in Killington. I don't think the pressure is on her quite like it has been in the past. She had a good result in Levy, then she DNF'd one of them or whatever. I don't know. Didn't feel, I wasn't sure if she came out of Levy with a ton of confidence. However, this race right here tells me that she has the confidence she needs to compete, and now this should be a huge springboard for her to try and achieve one of those high-level runs like Petra and Michaela are, and even Wendy Holdner. So, great job, Paula Moulton. Next up was Katrina Linsberger. She comes down 0.44 ahead. This was the Katrina Linsberger run that she has been needing. It was fast. It was aggressive. A little bit wilder. She's making mistakes now. Last season, she was just so fluid and never made these little bobbles. This year, it looks like the little bobbles and mistakes are here to stay, but she can also make up for it with her aggressiveness and her ability to fly down the course. Um, 
It might just be the way she's going to be this year. And she's going to have to reel in these mistakes and these little baubles uh, to get all the way to the podium. However, fourth place on the day with a charging second run uh, made it really tough on Elena Dur, who was next, to come down and best her. Elena Dur did not repeat her podium. However, she skied well again. She is very good on the pitch. I don't know why Ted was saying she's mostly a flat skier. I completely disagree. It was the pitch at Levy where she did her damage on the rest of the field. And it was the pitch at Killington where she was just a little cleaner. She has one of the cleanest ski to snow contacts on the girl's side right now. It's a nice feathered, schmeary edge pressure with a little set. Cruise across the hill. Atlanta Door's got some real deal skiing. Um, just wasn't fast enough because Leansberger was fast enough. Up next, Wendy Holdner. On the podium, she comes down 0.58 ahead of Leansberger. Um, she had a lot of that lead from the first run. Wendy skied great again. Wendy is absolutely on form. However, she just lacks that like miraculous run of full speed. And she's going to find it eventually, but does she need to? I don't know. Here's another one. I'm so sick of hearing that she's never won a race. Why do we need to talk about it? She's awesome. She's out there charging. Next up was Michaela Schifrin. Um, she had 0.38 over Holdner at the start. She had 0.83 over Holdner at the bottom. So she put some time into Holdner. She did make the mistake on the flats, which Petra may have seen. And if Petra saw that mistake on the flats, Petra might have been thinking, I got this. Um, not sure if Petra heard the roar from the crowd. Uh, I don't think the roar from the crowd was there, to be quite honest, judging by the way Michaela was trying to roz him up in the finish line. However, Michaela threw down a run that was strong. It was fast. I definitely think it put pressure on Petra, although I don't think that Petra really was that worried about it because she may have seen the mistake. In any case, Petra comes out with, what was it? A two-tenth lead on Michaela. And on the same gate where Michaela made her mistake, right? She got twisted, but then Michaela was able to just use her core, get her outside ski into the snow, and then twist her core back into the right spot and didn't lose any time. I don't think Michaela lost any speed in that recovery. It was a phenomenal recovery. Um, Petra, who may have seen that mistake from Michaela right there, may have gotten to that part of the course and just had a brain freeze at all. Oh, this is what happened to Michaela, or this is where Michaela had her issue. Petra's inside ski just got stuck in a groove, and she didn't come out of it smoothly and lift her inside leg up to finish to finish the turn. And it got stuck, and then as she made the move of the other, her hips just went straight up, and she was bucking, then boom, low, low. At that point, the race was lost. You knew Michaela had it because she was clean the rest of the way down. No matter how dirty Petra skied the bottom, it wasn't going to matter. Um, it was awesome in my house. I uh, busted out the video camera to watch Petra's run. Enjoy it. This is me sitting watching the race with Dylan and Bryce. And you'll find out who their favorite ski racer is. Who's skiing right now, Dylan? Petra. <laughs> Petra. Oh, there's the mistake, Dylan. I think we've got a Michaela winner here. Dylan, did Petra just make a mistake? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, is she 0.83 back right now? Yeah. Who's going to win, Dylan? Petra Who's Who, Bryce? Come over here. Who's going to win today? Petra Hofa. Well, what if Michaela Schifrin wins? No. Petra no? Dude, she's 9, 0.97 out right now. Who's your favorite ski racer, Bryce? Petra. Second. Petra Vahov is your favorite right now? Yeah. Dylan, who's your favorite? Petra. Oh, you guys both like Petra more. Well, that was awesome. Michaela gets Petra. the win at Killington. So there it was. That was me watching the race with my family. We had a great time. The boys are kind of into it. They're kind of mad they're not watching cartoons, but um, they're learning some names. And that's all I can hope for. And Bryce is starting to carve, and he wants to ski like Petra Vahova. Especially the 21-22 Petrovohova. This is the best Petrovohova ever. It's time for the base scheme breakdown. The specific turns we're looking at here are the turns on the main pitch at Killington. And as the athletes break over, there's a long camera shot where it goes next to them on the side. And then the next camera shot is a face-on camera shot. These are the turns we're talking about. Those are the turns that are above the flush where the camera switches again. Okay, so we're talking about the turns that were just the turns 
on that head on camera shot, okay? In today's base game breakdown, we are going to be looking at the actual turn shapes of the pressuring of the ski from a variety of different athletes. There is no one way to make a turn, and there are a lot of different athletes making the turns in a lot of different ways on the World Cup. What we are looking at here is a pressure map of where the athletes are going from their unweighting, their unweighted position from the transition to actual ski to snow contact. In every case, there is a little bit of action. The skis may be on the snow up here, but the pressuring of the ski isn't happening to the dark, bold places. And if I were to just draw in the path of the ski above each, I think that we would all agree and they would all end up looking the same. So let's just focus on where the pressuring is happening on the skis. We're going to look at Katrina Truppe, Hannah Elfman, Andrea Schlokar, Michaela Schifrin, and Petra Vahova. And each of these girls have a very different pressuring of the ski. Katrina Truppe, I've said it before, has the smallest quickest edge set and pressure on the World Cup. It is extremely in the fall line. It's very quick. It's almost a little an off. And she is still, the skis are on the snow here, but she's done with her pressure and she's releasing it quickly, something that Ted talks about a lot in the broadcast. Hannah, she is running a more, um, there's a little more arc in the ski when she gets to her pressure. She's rolling it in a little bit more and she's starting to smear the ski while it's still going out a little bit and that's why you get the little fatter portion up here. This is smeared in and then she sets the edge quickly and she almost had a little hook at the bottom of the turn. So Hannah is running this little bit of a smear on the way in but bending the ski early in the turn and then a little hook at the bottom. Now she was able to fly down the course here because it was smoother. I don't know if Hannah could have gotten away with this quick edge pressure and set had she been running when Schifrin and Volhova go. Okay, so I think Hannah's run is very indicative of when she ran and uh, how clean the course was because she was able to get away with this. And she's getting away with a little bit of a hook at the bottom of each turn, but she hooks collects it, collects the rebound, like the coach was talking about, Paul Moulton, collects the rebound, gets the skis up on edge, lands in a carve, carves through the gate cleanly, and the little hook, but collects the energy to keep it moving down the hill versus the hook where you start going back up the hill and you're slow. So Hannah was able to fly down the course, making these early edge carves with a little hook, but the really tight edge pressures, and this is probably what Ted talks about when you're talking about chopping off the line, Hannah's running this super aggressive, ultra tight line with this little hook and is super fast with it. Not as tight of a line as Trupe. However, Trupe doesn't start the turn with a carved ski. She comes in and she's directed already that way with the skis before she pressures. Schlokar was the uh, reason I wanted to do this breakdown right here today because she is running the largest turn shape, the largest radius of all the girls on the World Cup right now. She's using a lot of hip angle. I'd say the next girl out there that's closest to Shlokar would be Erin Milzinski, but Erin Milzinski is not doing it with the power that Shlokar is or the accuracy that Shlokar is. And so Shlokar is running this big radius here where there's a lot of the smearing of the ski, but it's already carving up here and coming in. Okay. So you can see, see that it's smeared here, smeared, 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 tight arc at the bottom. And this is the way Shilkar is running it. This is tougher to run um, on a hill like Killington, for sure, where there's a consistent long pitch. Um, this works good in like six gate pitches. But Shilkar is awesome, and she's running with power, and it looks sick. So it's cool. Um, okay, Michaela Schifrin. This is to scale. By the way, I really believe this is to scale. Michaela Schifrin is a little bit tighter than Shlokar, but this is on purpose here. Michaela is way further up and out than Shlokar is. Here's the gate right here. Michaela's apex right here is really far up, but really far out. Michaela was getting her turn done way up in here. And you can see that she's running where she's carving in, starting the, the schmear with a carved ski right here. A lot of schmear, a lot of schmear, a lot of schmear, but it's powerful. 
and it's fast right here. And I think most importantly with Michaela, it's accurate and it's turn after turn all the way down the pitch. Why is she turning this far up and this far out? Probably because the course conditions are breaking down and this is what she needs to do to stay fast at this point in the race. All the girls that came down ahead of Michaela and chopped off the line, like if you take this pressure from Hannah and this pressure from Trupe, those pressures are in this zone right here. Michaela's completely avoiding these initiations from two athletes in the field. Let me tell you, there's more athletes trying this than there are these. And so Michaela, by going way up and out, is able to just maintain speed. And maybe it's not the fastest way for her to ski race. Uh, she can be fast with this move as well as this move in this one. But usually these two, she didn't use it here. So tactical maneuver, but that's what her turn shape, her pressure looked like. Now, Vohova, Vohova had made the mistake up top. We already knew she was out of it, but she gave it a good go on the pitch, and I think it was a competitive time down the pitch. Um, Vohova is drifting the skis past the fall line and starting her turn where she's already coming across the hill. And this is what Vohova's turn looks like right now. And on that pitch is that she is starting the turn with the ski already directed towards the next gate, not all the way to the next gate, she's definitely completing the turn here, but she's pivoting the skis past the fall line and then pressuring, here's her feather right here, and then it comes into a nice tight exit right there. Vohova can beat Michaela with this technique because she's stronger, dare I say stronger, I mean she's got crazy leg pressure and if you're just putting the oomph into this, you can make it fast and that's what Petra's doing. She's perpetually moving down the hill and doing it with these hard, strong edge pressures here, um, coming up clean every time and that's what matters is she's coming up clean every time. We get into chopping off the line. Yeah, chopping off the line would be coming inside of these two moves here, but you need a clean track to pull it off effectively. Uh, edge pressure, I think those are the edge pressures we're looking at. How can all these turns work on the World Cup and keep girls competitive? Well, at the end of the day, there is the magnitude of pressure. How hard are you pushing on the ski right now? The harder you push on the ski, the more G-forces, the more G-forces, the more ability for uh, centripetal forces and acceleration. So, Trupe obviously doesn't press super hard. She's very light and, um, you know, doing this quick little edge set. She's not pushing as hard, there's not as many G-forces. Hannah had a lot of G-forces here in this tight little arc. Clean snow conditions, awesome run. Slow car, a lot of G-forces, but over a long distance of time. Schifrin, more G-forces early, okay? Good tactics. And the Vohova, the most G-forces just in this almost zigzaggy way of skiing. I mean, Petra's pressures all the way down the hill look like this. It just chops down the hill. Almost like a mogul skier. I don't know. In any case, it's awesome. I love it. Um, the girls are skiing really well. It's really fun to watch. And I'm going to keep watching this thing so you don't have to. My hot take on the Petra and Michaela rivalry. Petra's body language in the finish line was a total downness, bummed out. She knew she had lost it. And then Michaela's body language in the finish line was a uh, Oh, I'm relieved I won, but I know I didn't earn it because Petra had that huge mistake up there and I don't know if I'm actually better than her right now. And neither girl just had the elation of a first or a second because they're both so worried about, well, Petra's thinking, am I actually still better than her? And Michaela's thinking, am I actually still better than her? And it's, there's a lot going on in that rivalry right now. I, in my head, had thought that Petra was moving way ahead with those two slalom wins in a row. However, just being tied with Michaela in the overall standings, now Michaela has a win, now the balance of power is back with Michaela. This thing is stacking up to be a phenomenal overall competition. And we haven't even seen Laura Gubarami go in another event yet, so the Slalom girls rack up all these points and Laura Gubarami must just be stewing right now, having not got the chance to win a race yesterday and now Heading up to Lake Louise, where I think she's going to be spectacular. I can't wait. It's going to be some really exciting racing up there. Uh, the, Cana the Super G for the men was canceled. Not talking about that. Did I have any other hot takes that I was supposed to talk about? Brett, did I miss anything? Did we beg for subscribers? Think anyone's going to do it? It's free. All right. We read the YouTube comment. Oh, I think we got a, we got a show, Brett. How long was this one? 
48 minutes. Oh, this is going to be a lot of editing. All right. Enjoy it out there.